And we're tickled to death to have Cal Elliston with us tonight, and he'll be speaking on Hosea. And uh, of course, we have one more summer series next Wednesday evening on the 30th, and it'll be with Jason Sage. And his lesson he'll be speaking on will be Mal Malachi. You're probably expecting to see Zach up here tonight because they normally handle the uh, announcements when they were on our visiting preacher. But uh, Zach called me this evening, and uh, he said, would I make the announcements tonight that he had got a call from Millview that he was supposed to hold their summer series tonight? And he said, uh, could we elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> it seems that he was at a group with a group meeting with some preachers or something at some point in the past. And one of the ladies, was, I'm not sure of who she was, but anyway, she said, we would really like to hear, well, could you help us on our summer series? He said, I'd like to look into that. That's all he heard. But they had been sending him emails with the wrong address. So he didn't know anything about it. So he, <laughs> he told them that he would be glad to do that this evening. So that's why Zach is not here. Mitch is in their, their summer series over at uh, Parkway. So if you're visiting with us, there's Melissa coming in. Good to see you. Melissa is here with us. So glad to have you all. She's, she's good, doing better, and so, so tickled to death to have her, have her here tonight. Joe, I want to <clears throat> just touch bases on some tonight. Uh, I, I know I'll leave some out. I can't get uh, everybody, but uh, one of the, t uh, Georgia Barker had been out for a while, and she had been attending with at Jackson Heights because that's just about four or five miles from <clears throat> her home, and she will be attending there uh, until she can get, uh, what the doctors say, 100% of her health back. Hayden Townsley is still in ICU at St. Thomas West, and uh, he's still no change on that as far as uh, the last that I have heard. Tom Harrison is uh, having treatments for his problem, and uh, he's accepting that quite well. Also, Wanda Barnes has had COVID, and Phil has been tested, and he's, he's all right. So uh, he hadn't got that yet. But Wanda's get, getting a little bit better. Ms. B, Ms. Barnes, uh, is uh, getting better also. And I called Ronnie the other day, Ronnie Singleton. Both of them have it, first time. And uh, it's really knocked the props out from under them, might I say. He's, uh, he was uh, laying down, uh, not feeling very well whenever I called, but he is much, he is much better. And uh, I don't uh, have anything else as, as far, it's just glad to have you. And uh, we will have, uh, I think, uh, our preacher, uh, Kyle, yeah, so welcome, and we're glad you, and if we'll ever have the song leading.
have your Bibles this evening, you turn with us to the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea. The Word of God. It's good to see the presence of each of you here tonight. We're thankful that you have chosen to come this way. And I'm thankful that you have uh, decided to have me back, just to be quite honest with you. I'm just glad to be back with you. Uh, listen, some places I don't get invited to a second go around, so uh, I'm going to start out wrong with my notes upside down. Let me fix that. Hosea chapter 1 in the Word of God. Again, good to see the presence of each of you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get to come here and to worship with you. We enjoyed our time last year. We had a, a wonderful meal tonight uh, that was uh, provided for us, and we were able to fellowship in that way. And uh, your hospitality is just uh, an encouragement to us. And uh, of course, as you know, this church has been a wonderful and kind supporter uh, as, as uh, my wife and I work there just north of Birmingham with the church at Mount Olive. And uh, before we dive into Jose, I just want to give you a, a few thoughts about that. Uh, I, I want to first of all thank you. I want to thank you for your kindness and your generosity. Uh, that, that work is... Uh, it's like any work, it's a work, right? I mean, when we say that, but God has blessed and uh, he, has, he is helping. And uh, so at Mount Olive, we're, we're just, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a gradual step-by-step. Step. The church there, we're running about 30, 35 now. A year ago, we were running about 20. And so uh, we've had some great success. And uh, I, I told the church, I'll, t I'll share this with you, I, if you if you've not seen any uh, updates that I, I send out. I told the church a few months ago, I said, guys, we need to be teaching the gospel, right? I mean, that's what we teach people. Uh, I said, people are not just going to drive up in this church parking lot and uh, just want to obey the gospel. I mean, it's not how it works, right? That next Saturday, I got a phone call. A lady was driving by and pulled up in the parking lot and called me, and she said, I want to obey the gospel. I said, well, God, I guess that showed me. Uh, but we're, we're so thankful for that kind of fruit. And, and, and let me say this, like Paul said to the church at Philippi, my fruit is your fruit. And we share in that together, a common ministry. And, I, and I'm just so thankful for that. And, uh, and, and so the work there continues to progress in that way. God continues to bless. We're uh, doing a, a lot of activity trying to uh, be more visible in the public, public Bible readings, public Bible studies. Uh, we're currently working to get more material in mailboxes, door hangers, spreading the word because the area in which we are in in North Jefferson County is exploding with growth. I, I'll tell you, uh, before I get into the text, how much growth we're exploding with. They just put an olive garden down the street from us. So we're, we're actually getting somewhere. We're climbing up the chain. And so, uh, but, but I just say that to say that the work uh, in that area is is needful. There's, there's a need, as there is here, as there is in so many places we could say tonight. And I want to thank you for your kindness and for uh, the, the, the work that happens here and what you are doing. But do pray for us. Pray for that work. Pray for me as we navigate that work, as we continue to try to sow seeds of the gospel. And uh, one thing I want to ask you to do here to pray for, I'm, I'm not usually this open in public, but I will be tonight. I want to ask you to pray for us as we seek some men to serve as shepherds in that congregation. We have a, we have a man there, I think, that he may be... Uh, we've talked to him, but, but we need another man. And uh, I need you to pray. Jesus said to pray to the Lord of the harvest, that He would send laborers. And so help us pray for that, because that's our next big goal there as we go forward. Well, the book of Hosea, chapter 1, that's where we want to begin tonight. I, I want to do something, if you will allow me, and, and I don't know if this is what, uh, when Brother Phil lined us up, I don't know if this is what he had in mind necessarily, but uh, as a, I want to survey this book, but what I would like to do is really focus in on this relationship in this book between Hosea and Gomer, right? I mean, that's what we always want to go to. And I want to call your mind to that tonight and look at some truths in it. And of course, we're going to look at the book as an overview and see some of the truths that are written therein together. But I want us to look at that. People often ask me, they say, what is one of the big messages from the book of Hosea? And I, I tell them jokingly from watching Andy Griffith, stay away from women named Gomer, right? I mean, you... You would have thought that he knew this, but God used Gomer and Hosea here to paint a wonderful message for the people of Israel. And so I want us to look at that tonight together as we study in this text. 
Now before we do, I want to give you some background on the book of Hosea. You see, what we do a lot of times, well, what I've done, you may not do this, you may do this, is I've come to the minor prophets and I've kind of just skimmed them, right? I mean, we a lot of times treat them like the genealogy in Matthew 1. So and so begot so and so and begot so and so and lo and behold, here we are and move on, right? We, we don't spend a lot of time with them. But I want you to become intimately involved and knowledgeable about these prophets. Because these, though we call them minor prophets, they have a major message. And so we need to become very familiar with them. We need to know what they were preaching and teaching. Now, Hosea is a prophet to the nation of Israel. The Word of God teaches us that, and, and we won't go through every chapter, but if you'll allow me quickly just to paint the picture for you, he is prophesying in a time of terrible morality among Israel. During the days of Hosea's ministry, Israel was a very prosperous nation materially. They enjoyed peace politically, militarily, but the truth is that they were morally bankrupt. The nation of Israel was morally bankrupt. There are messages in Hosea that go both to the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms, and the call is that God loves them as a man would love a wife... And he wants to be their God. And while the people of Israel had no real love for God or for His Word or for His worship, when a prophet showed up, they seemed to be very interested in what he had to say and in his actions. And that's why often God would use the personal life of prophets to illustrate a, a powerful and wonderful truth as He does in this book. And so in the book of Hosea, we're introduced in chapters 1 and 2 to Hosea's marriage to a woman by the name of Gomer. In fact, look what God says in Hosea 1 there in verse number 2. And the Lord began to speak by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife. I want to stop right there because we, we see God has instructed him to go take himself a wife. And then later on in chapter 3, we're going to see tonight Hosea's marriage to this woman described autobiographically, if you will. And then the latter parts of the book talk about God's judgment and His desire to have uh, the people of Israel back to Himself. But it's interesting. Why would God ask Hosea to go marry a wife? Well, you're probably familiar with this if you're any student of the Bible. But in Hosea's relationship in our text tonight, we're allowed to see a wonderful, beautiful portrait of redemption, not only for the nation of Israel, but the redemption that we can have in Jesus Christ. I want to take the verses that we read tonight and preach about this thought, God's redeeming love in the book of Hosea. I want us to see God's redeeming, powerful, reconciling work through the prophet. Hosea, I want you to understand this. So Christian, next time you're reading the Bible, don't get to these small books and just thumb over them. Spend some time with them. Spend some time with the Hoseas and the, the Malachi's and the Micah's and the Zephaniah's and the Obadiah's. Uh, let's, let's get acquainted with them and see what's going on. And so if you'll allow me for a few moments, I want us to focus on this marriage for, for a, a few seconds together tonight. First of all, I want you to see the wonder. If you like to take notes, I like to give outlines. I want you to see the wonder of a loving pursuit. The wonder of a loving pursuit. Go back with me to chapter 1. In verse number 1, the Bible says, "...the word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah." So these are the people that are ruling in Judah. And then also Jeroboam, the son of Joash, who was the king of Israel. And the Lord began to speak by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife. But look what kind of wife he said to take. A wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. 
You see, Israel ha- had been in this relationship with God. We know a covenant relationship since uh, the days of Abraham. God wanted to be their God, and He desired that they would be His people. And God pled with them and provided with them and gave them all that they needed pertaining to life and godliness. And yet for, for their own rebellious reasons, Israel time and time again rejected the God of Abraham and Isaac. They chose themselves. They chose their own lust. They chose their idols. They chose to reject God. And God, speaking to Hosea, said, Hosea, I want you to take yourself a wife of harlotry. I don't think that I have to define that too much for you, harlot. One who plays the harlot. God often described Israel as being this very thing. Someone who plays the harlot against Him. Who who is to be to Him a a bride, if you will. But instead, they are simply rebelling against Him. And so I want you to see, first of all tonight, Gomer's lifestyle. I want us to get acquainted a little bit with Gomer's lifestyle. To to understand the depth of Hosea's love, we we need to understand something about Gomer, this woman's life. When when she first appears here in our text, she's called, one translation calls her the wife of whoredoms. The King James says the wife of whoredoms and the children of whoredoms. Now if God came to you, I want you to think about this, and said, I want you to go marry that woman who's a harlot. (laughs) <laughs> no, I don't think so. Who would do that, right? I mean, you, why would you do that? You're setting yourself up for heartbreak and betrayal. But God sent Hosea to do that very thing. By the time we come to our text, we see that she is referred to as an adulteress in Hosea chapter 2, in verse number 5. God said for their mother, speaking of of the children that she had had, He said, for their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. At first, now Hosea's marriage to Gomer must have been a happy time for both of them. God blessed their union by giving them a son named Jezreel in uh, Hosea chapter 1 and verse number 4. The Lord, uh, the Bible said that, that he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel in the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. So we see a, a lifestyle of this woman. A, a glimpse into Gomer's lifestyle is a clear picture of what sin produces in every life that it touches. A lifestyle of unrepentant sin. A lifestyle of rebellion against God. Ultimately, a lifestyle like this leads to devastation and to hell. And she's a woman who leads a very promiscuous lifestyle. A woman who is steeped in sin and against the God of heaven. She shakes her fist. Look with me in chapter number 2. Say to your brethren, verse number 1, My people and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away your harlotries from her sight. This is, this is a, a speaking as a, a description of, of Gomer and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born, and made her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. Now understand, God is speaking against unfaithful people like Israel. But in the same way, we're seeing a description of this woman whom Hosea is told to go and take. So I want you to get this real quick. Gomer's lifestyle. She's called the, the, the wife of whoredoms. But I also want you to see the lust that Gomer has. The lust that she has. The Bible tells us that she had children... And she went out, she committed and played the harlot against Hosea the prophet. And of course, Gomer's actions are a a picture of the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel. I mean, this is a clear indication of the nation of Israel. 
They lusted after the gods of the Canaanites. They abandoned the gods of their fathers. I, would you go back to Sunday school with me, if I could use that word uh, for a moment, and think about those Old Testament stories of Israel. I mean, God brought them out by His own hand from Egypt. And not far removed, we get into the Exodus, and Moses is on top of Mount Sinai, received the Ten Commandments, and the children of Israel are at the foot of the mountain, engaging in sexual sin and worshiping a false idol. And saying, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. (laughs) No wonder God was fed up. I like what God said to Moses in that moment. God didn't say, Moses, go get my people. He said, Moses, your people are down there acting up. They're not mine, they're yours. Gomer was a, a portrait of the lust that consumed the nation of Israel. No wonder God wanted His prophet to marry a woman like this because how else could He effectively prophesy and preach except He felt what God felt. And He knew the pain that it brought God to love a people so much to not be loved back. Could you imagine that kind of pain? I'm not here tonight to just play on your emotions, but I really want you to think about what it would do to someone to love someone. And by the way, we're talking about the love of God so deeply. And they wouldn't have it. You see, Gomer was consumed in her lust. She was consumed in, in, in the way that she wanted to go. And can I pause here for a moment and just say, before we get on Israel, (laughs) before we get on Gomer, maybe we've got a little bit of Gomer in us from time to time. Maybe it is that we've got a little bit of Israel in us sometimes. You say, oh, preacher, what do you mean? Here I am on a Wednesday night. This is, the, I've read, this is the epitome, the climax of, of Christianity. But how often have we considered that God ha, has provided redemption, has given His Son, has recorded His Word, has provided salvation, has given us a gospel, has extended His grace, offered His mercy, and we might say, yes, I love you, Lord, but our lives live in direct contradiction to the grace that God has extended to us. Oh, I believe in Jesus. I love God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know all that. Blah, blah, blah. Move on. We want to know just enough of the gospel to get by, but not enough to allow the gospel to change our lives. And Israel seemed to have this very problem. Gomer had a lifestyle. She was called the wife of whoredoms. The the children that she had were children of whoredoms. She had a lust, an insatiable desire to go out and commit the harlotry against Hosea. And God had told Hosea to take this woman. I want you to see Gomer's lover. Though she is an adulteress, Hosea loves Gomer. Hosea loves Gomer. Why is that? Why why would he do that? how, how, how How could that happen? Well, there was great love extended for her. The Bible said in verse 3 of Hosea 1 that he went and took Gomer the daughter. He went and had this woman to himself whom he loved, whom he he cared for. And though she's an adulteress, Hosea loves Gomer. He's told in verse 1 what to do. Hosea, go love a woman. So we do just that. He goes after her because he loves her. And by the way, this isn't just written for us to sit here tonight and do nothing with. I say to you that this is a picture of God's love for sinners. Did you know that no one had to tell God to love you? Nobody had to tell God to love you. 
Nobody had to teach God to love you. He loved you before you were born. He loved you when you were an innocent child. He loved you when you chose sin over righteousness. He loves you today. In fact, God, through the prophet Jeremiah in 31.3, says that He had loved them with an everlasting love. And nothing can cause God to stop pursuing you until He has reconciled you back to Himself. This is the message of Hosea. In Ephesians 2 and 4, Paul said that God's love is a great love. It's a surpassing love. It's a love that knows no boundaries. It's an unconditional love. It's a timeless love. It's a self-sacrificing love. It's a love that's wonderful beyond words. That's the love of God. My friend, listen to me tonight. God loves you. And where His love ends, we have not yet reached it. You may spurn His love. Turn it away, but God continues to love you. Now, I know a lot of preachers have gotten up and, and preached the love of God till we're about nauseated as a society. With I get it. Uh, the, the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it ministries, right? I mean, that's about what it is. I'm not talking about a superficial love tonight. I'm talking about the God of heaven. You may not have time for Him but He continues to love you. You may ignore Him, but His heart is still set on you. Look at the wonderful, loving pursuit. You may turn a deaf ear to the pleas of God, but His calling doesn't stop. He loves you regardless of who you are, where you are, or what you've done. His love is an overcoming, overwhelming, all-inspiring love. The Bible teaches us that God loves sinners. You say, well, I don't have much to get excited about when it comes to church. Well, I want to tell you something, friends. That statement alone ought to give us enough to chew on for the next thousand years that God loves sinners. Paul said one of the greatest theological truths writing to the church at Rome, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My, what a truth, friends. God loved Israel with an everlasting love. And and, and friends, He cared so deeply. When Israel was hungry, what did God do? He rained down manna. They got to griping about manna, didn't they? You remember, ah, they said, I'm about tired of this. What did God do? He sent them meat. Ah, I know, we got manna, we got meat, but I'm thirsty. What did God do? He sent them water. (laughs) He gave them sustenance and food. He gave them a law. He promised them a land. I mean, God was ready to roll out the red carpet for these people. And they played the harlot against Him. And God chose a man like Hosea through him to show him what it felt like. And By the way, may I just say to you that the only reason you're sitting here tonight and you love God is because He first loved you. 1 John chapter 4 and 19, we love because He first loved us. Friend, we wouldn't even know what love was tonight if it were not for the wonderful love of Jesus. The wonder of a loving pursuit in the book of Hosea. Well, let's go on. Not only do we see the wonder of a loving pursuit, but I want you to see the wonder of a lavish purchase here. Now listen, on my slides it's put everything up here. I don't usually do that because I know what you do. You read ahead and then you clock out until I move on to the next point. I know because I sat out there too. So don't be reading ahead. We give you no previews. The wonder of a loving pursuit. Let me give you a second thought. In Hosea that we see another theme The wonder of a lavish purchase. The wonder of a lavish purchase. When Hosea finds Gomer, it it appears that she has been sold into slavery. It appears she's been sold into slavery. Go go with me to Hebrews, Hebrews, Hosea chapter 3. Hosea chapter 3.
The Bible says in verse number, one, verse number 1 of chapter 3, "...the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who looked to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans." Look at verse 2. "...so I bought her for myself for fifteen shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley." When Hosea finds Gomer... He's loved a woman who has committed the harlotry against him, adultery. He finds her. And she's a far cry from the woman whom he fell in love with. I mean, could you imagine a scene with me for just a moment, if I could paint a picture. Imagine Hosea searching for, for Gomer. She's, she's out again. She's going again, eventually finding her in the marketplace, in a slave market. And she is for sale to the highest bidder as if she is nothing but an inanimate piece of property. He finds her. I want you to see Hosea's price. The Scripture tells us that she was bought again for 15 pieces of silver and a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. Now, I realize that when we read that today, we're, we think, what, huh? I pay with, with you know, dollars and, you know, five dollars and quarters. How, how much can I get? Some barley. What are you talking about? Well... He pays half of her price in cash and the rest in some of the cheapest grains, which would be barley, a grain used by even the poorest of the poor for food, maybe even to feed the animals. But may I say to you that the cost of this was more than the money that he possessed. It also cost him some other things. I want you to think about Hosea's situation here for a moment. He's now got to go out and buy back the woman whom he loves out of this adultery and filth. It's a humbling experience. Think about the pride of Hosea. I mean, he certainly had to, to suffer in going and getting her. He had to purchase unto himself a woman who had betrayed him many times. And while it might be my inclination to say, leave her there, leave her where she's at. She goes out and plays the harlot. She doesn't want to be here. Let her be. But that's not what God did. That's not what Hosea did. Hosea's actions here in this text are a picture of what God has done for the lost. And like Gomer, the, the lost are slaves to their sin. But God in His great grace came into this world and gave Himself a sacrifice for sinners. I really want you to meditate on that for a moment. God gave Israel everything they needed. And the last words on the pages of your Old Testament, Malachi, close out speaking of destruction. The rejection of Israel against God. And you know what? I wouldn't have blamed God if God would have wiped the slate clean with Israel and said, I'm done, I'm done. That's not what he did. John records that God became flesh and came and dwelt among His own people. And we beheld Him as the glory of the only begotten Father, Jesus Christ. And He was grace upon grace. You see, God knows no end to His mercy and redemption and His loving pursuit. We're studying right now in the Gospel of Matthew at Mount Olive, and this has really been driving at me as I've thought about Hosea, Jesus coming in uh, to the city. Luke 17, you read about it, in the, and in Matthew, the 20th chapter, you read of the, the, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And shortly after that, Luke records in the 17th chapter that Jesus went up and wept over the city of Jerusalem. And He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my wings as a mother chick gathers her hens. Jesus wept for these people. But it was Stephen who said in Acts 7 to those men, you do as your forefathers did, always resist the Holy Spirit. They had a habit. But... God saw beyond just the people of Israel, and He saw you and I. And God paid a great price, a great price. You see, friend, they took Jesus and publicly humiliated Him. 
And sometimes I, I think that maybe we've whitewashed the price that God truly paid for you and I. I mean, truly, Hosea said that he bought back Gomer himself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half homers of barley. And while he bought her back with these physical things, may I say to you that you and I have been redeemed with something far greater than these physical things, but we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And it cost heaven's best. You see, salvation is free, but it, it was not cheap. Jesus suffered pain and shame and humiliation and spiritual separate, uh, to help us in our hour of spiritual separation. Why? So that He might redeem us. Jesus was beaten. He was ridiculed. He was spit upon. He was slapped. The Bible teaches us that they bound his hands up and chained him to a post and beat him unmercifully with torturous weapons. You say, oh, preacher, you don't have to talk about that tonight. Well, we need to. Friends, they, they, they ripped the flesh out of the back of the Son of God. It would not be very shocking to me if one could have peered into his innards and inside and seen his, his, his internal organs. And then they platted a crown of thorns upon his head, laid a cross on his back, and marched him through Jerusalem, bringing him to Calvary, stripping his clothes off of him, nailing him to a tree, and hoisting him up between heaven and earth so that he might be made a curse for you and I. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because of a lavish purchase. Jesus said, Father, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless not my will, but yours be done. Hosea paid a great price in this text. Why? So that Israel might also see the price that God would give for them. Well, not only do we see the price, but I want you to see the possession. Now, look, look with me in the text at what Hosea said. He said, now, I bought her, verse number 2, he said, I bought her for myself. I really think in Hosea 3, verses 1 through 4, if you wanted to sum this book up, you could do it right here. Look at the possession. He said, I bought her to me. She was purchased. This is what God desired to do with Israel, to be their God. To be their God. To be the God who, who ruled over them, who, who was their king. And while that was true with, with Israel of old, is it not true today that God wants to be our king? I read a story one time of a little boy who built a sailboat. He built the sail, he had it fixed up, he tarred and waxed it and painted the little boat and he took it to the lake and he pushed it in and he, he hoped against hope that this little boat would sail. And sure enough, the, 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 the wind of a little breeze filled the little sail and that boat went billowing and rippling across the water and along the waves. And suddenly, before the little boy knew it, the boat was out of his reach. He hoped maybe the breeze would shift and it would come sailing back to him and instead he Watch that boat get smaller as it sailed further and further away from him. And he went home crying. His mother asked him, what's wrong? And did it not work? He said, well, it did. It worked. It really worked too well. Sometime later, the little boy was downtown and walked past a second-hand store. And there in the window, he saw that boat that he had made. It was unmistakably his. So he went in and he said to the proprietor, he said, that is my boat. He walked to the window and he picked up his little boat and he started to leave with it. And the owner of the store said, wait a minute, son, that's my boat. I bought it from someone. The boy said, no, it's my boat. I made it. See? And he showed the little scratches and the marks where he had hammered and he had filed. The man said, I'm sorry, son, if you want it, you have to buy it. The poor little guy didn't have any money, but he worked hard and he saved his pennies. And finally one day he had enough money and he went back to the store and he bought his little boat. And as he left the store holding that boat close to him, he was heard saying this, You are my boat. In fact, you're twice my boat. I made you. And second, you're my boat because I bought you. Now friends, the God of heaven has created us. He created Israel. 
And He has redeemed us from the penalty of sin. This is what the book of Hosea is about. If you wanted to preach a gospel sermon, you could do it right here from Hosea. People say, well, I don't see Jesus in the Old Testament. I see Him in the first three verses of Hosea 3. If you ever think you're not worth much, just remember what God thinks of you. Could you ima- I want you to imagine with me for a moment. Let me go quickly. Gomer, she probably felt shameful. May have had tear-filled eyes, dirty, nasty. As an adulteress, she would have been seen as nothing more than a piece of property by men. Objectified. Looked at in a sinful sexual way. Constantly seeking to fill her heart with, uh, with, with, with immorality. Probably felt unworthy. And yet Hosea went and paid a great price for her. But the Bible said that she was bought back to him. He bought her for myself. May I say to you, friend, that you are not your own, but you were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. So tonight, Kyle Ellison doesn't belong to Kyle. I belong to Christ. Kyle no longer lives, but Christ lives in me. I live and move and have my being. How? By faith through the Son of God who loved me and died and gave Himself for me. You see, Gomer now was not only living just... She wasn't just to live for herself and her own satisfaction, but Hosea said, I bought her back to myself. Christian, I won't spend a lot of time there. There's a message. Let me just say this. You belong to God. Live like it. You were purchased at a high price. Live like it. God thought enough of you and God thought enough of me to redeem us. Hosea teaches us the wonder of a loving pursuit. Hosea teaches us the amazement of a, of a lavish purchase. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 and 20, You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are your own. No, which are God's. This is the message of Hosea. This is, this is what Hosea desires for Israel. This is greater than Hosea, what God desires for Israel. Look with me in chapter 4, in verse number 1. I want you to see how God describes Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of Israel. That's a harsh phrase. God is charging them with something. Look what He said. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery. They break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beast of the field and the birds of the air and even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Go with me to Hosea chapter 6. We're just hitting some high points. I don't have time to get into every chapter and every verse. Hosea chapter number 6 verse 1. Come and let us return to the Lord. For He has torn, but He will heal us. He has stricken, but He will bind us up. Look at Hosea 7 verse 1. When I would have healed Israel... Then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered and the wickedness of Samaria, for they have committed fraud. Verse number 4, they are all adulterers. Like an oven heated by a baker, he ceases stirring the fire after kneading the dough until it is leavened. Princes have made him sick and flamed with wine. Chapters 8 and 9, you go on through the, the remainder of the book. We won't have time tonight through chapter 14. We see this picture of Israel in their wickedness and in their sin. They are so concerned 
with self. They're given wholly to idolatry and false gods and, and gods that can, can do nothing for them. And the God of heaven and earth is pleading with them through the prophet Hosea. Their apostasy has come to God. Hosea 8 and verse 3 says, Israel rejected the good and now the enemy would pursue them. They set up kings, but it wasn't by God. They made princes, but God did not acknowledge them. From their silver and gold, they made idols for themselves. I want you to see this. This is what God wants Hosea to grasp through Gomer. Well, let me give you another point tonight. I try not to do more than eight or nine points in this sermon, so this is number three. What's funny? No, I'm, this is it. Let me give you a third thought about Hosea. The wonder of lasting purpose. Go back with me to Hosea 3. I know I've got you flipping a lot, but the idea was to give you an, a, 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 an overview of this book. So we're trying to get a lot in in just a little while. Back in Hosea 3, I told you the, the, the hinging of this book really could be summed up in these five uh, verses. Verse number 3. And I said to her, Talking about Hosea to Gomer, the woman who he was told to go love back in Hosea 1. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall, shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. Why did Hosea do this? I, I mean, why? Why? I mean, she has caused you heartache, Hosea. She's, she's proven herself unfaithful. Well, why would you be involved with her in any way? Well, one reason was to obey the clear command of God. I mean, obviously in chapter 1, God told him what to do. But I believe another reason too comes to light here, and, and it's rather simple that we should learn. He loved Gomer. And he sought to make a difference in her life. And he made a change. Look, he, he said, Gomer, you will have a new purpose. You will have a new purpose, a new character. He tells her, Gomer, no more will you play the harlot. Hosea expects a difference in Gomer. And thus it is for Israel that God wanted them to come. Now we know the story. We have the history of Israel to know that it, it, they, they continued in their rebellion. Even through the prophets, even through the life of Christ, even through the ministry of Stephen and, and Paul and others. Rebellion continued. But God wanted a relationship. And to those of us who have called on the name of the Lord, to those of us who have been redeemed, God's given us a great purpose. There's a new character. There should be a new character. You show me someone who has no change, I'll show you someone who has no Christ. Friend, if you're in Christ Jesus, you ought to walk different. You ought to talk different. You ought to live different. You ought to think different. I, the list could go on. Let me ask you a question tonight. Somebody said, Preacher, I, I didn't come for all this. It's just Wednesday night Bible study. What's the difference between you and someone out in the world right now, besides sitting here on a Wednesday night? Compare your lives. What's different? Is there anything different? If there's not, why, what, well, there's a problem. You, you see, Gomer was redeemed to be something new, not to continue in her sin. God did not want Israel to continue in the path that they were going on. He later on would speak about the restoration of Israel and what God would do for them later on in chapters 13 and 14. But friend, may I say to you that Hosea expected through Gomer and as an extension Israel... To have a new character. Hosea tells her that her life will be different. Let me say something to you. You cannot meet Jesus and stay like you are. You can't do it. Not only is there a new character, but there's a new commitment. Hosea tells her that you will abide with me for many days. You, you will not play the harlot. You will not be for another man. And I will be the same way for you. He's telling her that he expects her to show the same kind of fidelity 
Hosea wants Gomer to know that her days of, of loose and sinful living is, is over. And then there's another truth in this passage. That Gomer has a new companion. And as it is God would be to Israel, and as it is God is to those that are saved today. I would imagine that when Hosea sacrificed his money and his time and his dignity to purchase Gomer, surely she would have begun to see him through different eyes. Evidently, at some point she had become sick with their home life and abandoned it. But now he had proven his love for her and no doubt a new love for him. May I say to you, friends, that these are truths that should be evident in your life and mine as well. Listen to me. God wanted to be all that Israel needed. He gave them everything sufficient. They rejected. And the truth is that God has given you and I everything pertaining to life and godliness today. And even still, sometimes we reject it. And yet He chooses to be our God. In fact, the Hebrew writer in chapter uh, 11 talks about a city whose builder and maker is God. A place where we would be His people and He would be our God. And He is not ashamed to be called our God. He's a, a companion. Go, uh, Hosea said, Gomer, you'll be mine. And we'll walk together in fidelity. We'll be joined together, both of us. Will you have it, Gomer? Will you have it, Israel? Will you have it, brother or sister? Will you have it, lost person? You see, this was a message to Israel over two millennia ago. The cry of the Holy Spirit comes today, and it's this. Will you be Christ Jesus? Will you belong to Him? Live for Jesus, O oh my brother. His disciple ever be. Let me share this with you in closing. That's the, that's the story of Hosea, redeeming love. Years ago, there was a preacher by the name of A.J. Gordon at a church in Boston. He, he met a young boy in front of the church building one day. He was carrying an old rusty cage. In, inside of that cage, there were several birds just fluttering their wings nervously. Now the preacher Gordon inquired, he said, Son, now where exactly did you get those birds? The boy replied, Well, I trapped them in the field. Preacher said, young man, what, what are you going to do with them? He said, well, I, I guess I'm going to play with them, and, and, and then I guess I'll feed them the old cat we have at the house. The preacher offered to buy the birds from that young man. Offered to buy them. That young boy said, preacher, you don't want these birds, these old birds. You're not going to, to pay anything. The preacher replied, he said, I'll give you $2 for the cage and the birds. The young boy said, okay, but it's a bad deal. But you're making, a, you're making the bad bargain. The exchange was made and the boy went away whistling, happy with his new coins. And the preacher walked around to the back of the church property. He, he opened the door of that cage, that small wire coop, and he let those struggling creatures out and spread their wings. They soared into the blue. And the next Sunday, that preacher took that empty birdcage into the pulpit with him. He said, I bought these birds from a young boy on the street the other day, and he told me they were not songbirds. He said, but when I released them and they winged their way toward heaven, it seemed as if they were singing, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. You see, you and I for a long time were held captive to the slave of sin. Israel was held captive to the slave of sin. But Christ has purchased our pardon and set us at liberty. And you and I have far more value than any bird or sparrow. And nothing in this world amazes me more than the love of God. So I'd ask you tonight, are you living like Gomer? Gomer? Are you playing the harlot on God? Are you running adulterously around on God? 
You see, through the prophet Hosea, God said, come home. Maybe you're here tonight. I don't know everyone in this auditorium. Probably don't know more of you than I do know. Are you a Christian? If you're not, why, why are you waiting? You see, the same price that Jesus paid for me, the preacher standing here preaching tonight, He paid for you. It's very simple tonight. If you would come, confess Him as Lord, turn from your sins and die with Him in the waters of baptism. If you'd allow me to say this, He'll open a cage and you can fly on your way singing, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Friend, tonight, if you've played the adulteress against God, would you repent? Would you say, God, I'm so sorry? You know what He'll do? He'll take you off the slave block of sin and clean you up and set you right and anew and send you on your way. If there's anything we can do tonight, if you need to make anything right, would you make it known as together we stand and as we sing? Hardly a comfort now Another great lesson. Uh, seemed like it started yesterday. The summer series ends next Wednesday night. And again, thanks to Phil for all his work and the lining these up and the topics. I wish I could take credit, but I have to give it to Phil. Uh, but we appreciate you coming up. Y'all have safe travels if you're going home tonight. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We thank you for this opportunity, this great country in which we live. The very freedoms that we so often take for granted, the, the opportunity to come to a beautiful building like this, secure from authorities, from ridicule, for the opportunity to have to learn more about you, to study this summer of the minor prophets that we know better. We have great examples of men of faith and their journey and 
even more important, they, they may not have always done it perfectly or gotten it right, but your mercy reigns supreme. Your will is done through these actions. And in the end, it's all for our learning, our, our understanding, and to help us prepare to serve thee better each day as we go through this walk. Be with us as we go in through the rest of this week if we have, our, have opportunity to serve our fellow man. that We don't miss these windows that it only takes, as you said, sometimes just a cup of water. It can be the smallest things that mean the most to people in their moments of need, most especially that we share our spiritual joy that we have within us, the, the opportunity that we know that this is a short life and that we can have a home with thee forever. Let us share those each day with the ones we come in contact with. Be with those who've traveled tonight, give them safety. Be with our many here that we know are sick. There's so many needs that you know before we ask. We just ask that they receive comfort and you, the doctors and different ones that are tending to them have understanding, patience, and the skill to make an improvement. Be with us now. Bring us back here on Sunday morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.